This episode is part one of a two-part series. Today, we interview a loving mother, Claire Jo, to share with us her journey from childhood in Barbados, where she sought relief from the chaos of living under domestic violence. She shares with us her treacherous escape to the United States, where she reached what she thought was the end of her road and how her faith in Buddhism gave her hope and happiness. Today, Claire uses her creative works and writings to encourage women identified and femme expressing trauma survivors to utilize art for self improvement. Listeners, stay tuned for the next episode where we interview her daughter, Amarinthia, to hear how the two stories are independent yet beautifully interwoven. So, how would you just in general describe your childhood? Oh, wow. I would say. I really came into awareness around age four. And the first, the earliest memory I have is like waking up into this room, this this room that was lit by a candle and a kerosene lamp. And I remember this light and that this nice, this soft light in this darkened room. And I was staying at relatives. My father had kicked us out on the streets. And at the same time, I heard this, my mom screaming on the outside and my dad was beating my mom on the outside because he wanted her to come back home and she was screaming and he was beating her. And I heard that and it, I felt very afraid. It was very fearful, a fearful moment. And, but at the same time, there was this light in this room that comforted me and comforted me and soothed me, soothed me. So I was, wow, this, Although I was afraid, I felt there was a calmness that came over me and I could remember it so vividly. And the next day, my mom went back with my dad and the domestic violence exploded again, right through my teens. And it just was like that. But there were moments when there were, I could remember there were moments when, you know, I was discovering Barbados the beauty that was around me, the smells, the everything was so intense and beautiful. The skies, the open, wide open skies, the, the stars at night, the different stages of the moon, the blues, the yellows, the reds, the intense colors, the, every, the, the earth, the, you know, the, when the rain fell, how that, that the smells from that, the animals, the different type of animals and the, and the, the people and the the markets, all that was infused with this balance, right? Mm. That was in my life. And so it was like, I don't know, I throughout my young life, it was like, how could something be so beautiful and how could there be so much pain, right? right? At the same time. And I would always find comfort in the ocean going to the ocean and smelling that salt air and dipping my toes in the sand and feeling that the textures the the colors the the rhythms the sounds the everything was just so it was just i can't even a very intense Mm. everything was very intense and at the same time there was this violence so how do you reconcile that as a young person? Yeah. You know, so that's where I began writing. Right. And that helped a lot. Yeah. It sounds like you do have quite a writer's mindset or mentality because even in the way that you're describing the things that you look and you see around you, the nature around mm-hmm. you, um, <clears throat> you know, the colors and the sounds, it's it's yes. something that really stood out to you. And I feel like that's the way a creative writer would see the world as well. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, like in the morning you woke up and there was a song of the rooster. And then this, and then we always had animals around. Mm-hmm. So I had goats, I had sheep, I had dogs, I had chickens and the smells from the animals and the rooster would wake you up. Even if you wanted to sleep in that rooster was out there, yeah. you know, wake <laughs> you up. And it was like so annoying. Yeah. But it was just, um, and then there was the fear of my father. Do and, you, and yeah. Do you recall ever having good memories with your father? Yes. I remember one thing that stood out for me when we had come back 
from one of those times when he had put us out. And at that time, I had, I didn't realize, um, I think I something had clicked because the first time when they put us out, when he put us out, we had out of the house, out of our home, my mom had opened her door and there was a baby lying at the, on the, the doorstep. And she took the baby in and that precipitated us leaving because we found out, she found out that that was a baby from one of his women. I was young at that time, but I was like, you know, I observed that. And then that whole thing I told you about living at the relatives and he took us back home. And I remembered um, one time it was raining and I loved to jump in the puddles. Mm. You know, and it was muddy and I like to slip and slide in them. And I just like to get muddy and without shoes. So I would rub, run up and down what we would call a gap. A gap is like an, a little opening. Yeah. And that's where people would live. There would be houses a, 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 along the gap and it would be rocky. It wasn't paved or anything. And there was these puddles as it was raining and I was just all soaking wet. And I was in this puddle jumping up and down. And then this, this slimy worm just sprang up and, and wrapped itself around my ankle. And I was so... I started, I was screaming and screaming and screaming and no one, everyone came out to the house, their houses, but no one would help me. And I remember screaming and screaming and I was yelling, daddy, daddy, and and mommy. And my father came out running and I, and he saw me and he grabbed, lift me up and he took a stick and he pulled it off and he pulled that worm off and he grabbed me and lift me, lifted me up in his arms and took me back home. Mm. And he washed me off. But this was the same man that another time in this same uh, development where we lived, this was the same man that um, beat me and my brother because we sprayed somebody's car with black paint. And we sprayed the car with black paint. He found out it was us because all the speckles of paint was in our hair. We Mm. were trying to sleep. So that he wouldn't discover it. And he realized it was us because it was a big problem. It was a mechanic's shop and we sprayed this paint on this car, white car. We wanted to make a, a line around the car. And when we stepped back, it was all zigzag, zigzagly line, right? Mm-hmm. And my father found out it was us. And he took me and my brother and he stripped us naked, beat us with what we call like a whip. We called it a dog hunter. It was like a a, a, a a leather whip. And he beat us with that till we had welts on our skin. And then he bathed us in disinfectant, whitened. It was so white. He dunked my brother in that disinfectant and the welts burned. Now, my, this was the same man that picked me up and took that worm off my leg and hugged me and took me home. And then here was the same man that did that thing to me. Mm. So you see the, that immediately as a young child that was developing this conflict within me of how could a person be good and kind and loving at, at one time and be so, you know, inflict so much pain. Right. You see, although I had good memories with him, there was this other side. So it's like an, on the one hand, like <clears throat> he's your safety because I, 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 mm-hmm. I hold mm-hmm. on to the fact that when this happened to you, the first words that came out of your mouth was mommy, daddy, you know, screaming for mm-hmm. help. So mm-hmm. in a sense, he was a, a safety net to you. Um, yes. But on the other side, he was also not your safety go-to person. I was afraid of him. Yeah. And I loved him, but I feared him yeah. as well. The the abuse towards your mom, what did that did that start sort of after you were born? Um did you watch the whole transition or was that already very well a part it was of it? The... Yes. She oh. told me that it, later she as as I got older she I learned that it was before it yeah. was happening before I was born. And probably, I think, even when I was in her belly. Wow. So, 
It wasn't something that I was born into it. I was in it, in, in that abusive situation in her tummy. And then when I came out, I came into it. Mm. And so, you know, it was always there. Do you ever recall or did you ever, you know, when you were able to sort of verbalize or express your thoughts and feelings, try to talk your mom to move out of the situation, to leave him, to move to a, a place safer? Um, do you ever have a conversation about that with your mom? I, well, it kind of, my mom eventually would leave him and she would always leave and find some place, another place with relatives or, or he would leave and go overseas. And then we would have a, a break. So it, I didn't really have to talk to her in those early days, only much later as I got older and he would always turn back up in our life. But in those younger days, not really. I wanted them to be together. Right. Yeah, that's interesting, right? In a sense that like you still wanted this unity, this unit of a family. You still yeah. wanted, yeah. Exactly. And it was because I learned that in Barbados at that time, when you didn't, when you weren't, your parents weren't married, they called you illegitimate. Right. And you were an Ill illegitimate child. So that was the first word I learned. I, I love the dictionary. And that was the first, one of the first words I learned. And I looked up in the dictionary and I understood what that meant. Mm. So I didn't want to be an illegitimate child. So I wanted my parents to marry, to be like the other children, some, the other children that I knew that were married. Right. My parents were married. So I didn't want to be illegitimate. Right. And in a sense, it's almost like normalized, right? You were born into that environment. So that's all you know. And maybe a part of you is thinking, well, maybe this is how it's meant to be. Like, I, I've never seen any other yeah. way. Have you, did you ever in your younger years talk to any friends about it or your teachers about it? Was it something? It was, that... out, in, it was out in the open. We, everything was out in the open because he violent. He would, it would go out into the streets. It would be a situation where if you ran from him, he'd throw rocks at you as you're running and people had to take you in. He would, you would, I would, if he, when he would beat my mom up, I would throw my body in front of her, throw my body in front of my brother. And then he would turn on me and sometimes they would escape and I would be the only one in the house with him. And then I would be beaten terribly. And then if I escaped, he would throw rocks and I would be running and rocks would be and do dodging all these rocks that would be coming at me. And I would have neighbors begging him, please don't do this. And it was just, and my mom, if she, she tried, she tried to, she didn't finish. Um, I don't think, I think she probably went up to middle school or something. My mom, she went, she could read, she could write, she could do math and everything. And she wanted to be a nurse. She would try to take classes. He'd go to the classes, pull her out and beat her. And she could never advance her life. Yeah. So it's almost like he wanted this sense of like dependency. He didn't want her to have her own independence. and. No, but he wanted to have everything he wanted to have all the women he wanted to do what he wanted but yeah. you know he wanted her not to have not to be able to do anything and she would find little ways to maybe sew or but if he saw her doing making clothes for me or anything he would you know tear them he would tear them up cut them up he would berate her mm. No, it was just, yeah, sure. but then he would find times to take me to the ocean. Mm. And then when I would be really happy and then he'd take me to the ocean and I remembered I I was, when the first time I remember seeing the ocean, I was wearing my pink, a pink bathing suit and the, I, all these huge waves were coming and I was like, 
wow, this is so, I was just, my whole body was absorbing what that feeling was like, just the smells and the surf and how the waves were crashing, the colors, how it would froth on the edges. And I was like, I, the rocks that were be churning up and I wanted to be in that ocean, but I was afraid of it. I couldn't swim mm. and I was afraid to go in. And my father, he wanted me to go in and I was so excited to be at the ocean with him and he just grabbed me up and he threw me into the ocean. Mm. And I just, it, I just remember tumbling, 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 tumbling. I was, oh my, I felt like I was going to die right. and there was no one to, to pull me up. And I made it back to the front, to the, I made it back and he was there and he was just looking at me. He was like, you see, you can do it. Mm. I, put, I got myself out of it, but, and that then became like, wow, I was afraid of the ocean, but I loved it at the same time. So mm. there's that dynamic again, that love hate relationship mm. was something that was way bigger than me. That was more powerful than me that I longed to be a part of it, but I was afraid of it. Yeah. That same dynamic with him, mm. that same dynamic with the ocean, mm. the respect, the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. So can you walk me through that moment that you, you mentioned that you, your dad uh, kicked you and your family out of the house and you decided to make, uh, to leave Barbados and go to the U.S. What was that like? How did you make that happen? Yeah. Oh, at 13, at 13 was the rupture where it broke and my, my dad, kicked my brother out into the street. He was 30, he was 12 years old. And he was, my brother um, was very smart and he got into one of the, one of the really top schools. But we found out that he wasn't going to school. He was hanging out with the Rastafarians and smoking weed. My father found that out, kicked him out of the street. And my mom and I were like, how can you do this? And he beat us up, put us out into the streets. It was like into the night, midnight, late at night. We barely had like, we were only able to get flip flops. And we had to walk miles to get to somebody, to someone's home to, to um, for shelter. And that was, my brother ended up going to live in the hills with the Rastafarians. And that was pretty much, he never came back to himself at 12 years old. He was out on the streets and he died at 32 from AIDS. He never really came back. Were you in touch with him? um, Like after he left, did you ever meet him or see him again? He was pretty much gone. Um, We never really connected, but I was, I remember um, I went on a trip to Senegal, West Africa to to do some research for my work in college. And when I came back, I was lying in bed in college, my college dorm, and the clock hit midnight and the alarm went off and I I jumped out of the bed and I was like, ah, something, I, I, I heard like Hendy, my brother's name, Hendy. And then I, right after I got a call and learned that, um, he had, was dying from AIDS and they wanted me to come back. So I went back and I was with him in his last days. He died around this time, Easter in in the late nineties. And um, I, I really find it interesting that my whole cancer situation was around the same time um, that he died. He died around in, in Lent and my whole cancer the situation happened last year around the whole Lent season of Lent mm. and Easter. And that was when he died. And I stayed by his side um, till he passed. And I remember it was, um, I gave him some flowers. He was in the hospital. I gave him some flowers. And then they called us to tell us that he was dying. And I I, I had put those flowers on his bed for the week that he was in the hospital. And when I went back, he was dead on the bed. And I looked at him. I remember feeling his presence in the room. 
And I was so scared. And I was like, he was just cold on the bed. And the flowers that I had given him, the roses, they were all dead on the counter next to him. And that was a memory that I carried with me. And I just, it just for many years, I, I just couldn't reconcile it. I, it was very painful for me for years. Mm. I'm okay now, but his loss was just like a, left a gaping hole in my life. Yeah, I can imagine. I never really got back with him, except to help him through his last days. Right. You know, I remember being in the ambulance as as we took him, they took him to, they were taking him to the hospital and they were trying to get the the um, the um bed through the door to take him to the ambulance and it wouldn't fit, couldn't get him through the door. And I was like, I wrote a poem about that whole situation and, and how we were in the ambulance and as the ambulance was going through the places that we played when we were younger. And I remember this is going to be the last time I'm going to be with him. And we were in the ambulance going to the hospital and he just went from the hospital to the hospice and then back. Mm. I think, no, he went hospice, hospital, and then he died. Really? Yeah, that's really difficult because it's like <clears throat> the last time you remember seeing him, you know, it was in such a difficult situation, such a difficult, you know, moment, you know, of him being kicked out of, you know, your family home and, and all of that. And then the, then the next time seeing him, he's sort of yeah like you know well i saw him i saw him a couple of times when i went back but he still didn't really connect he was doing drugs he was in a lot of trouble so i saw yeah. him being that time i i would try to help him you know when he was living with the rastafarians mm. so i did see him throughout you know but i never he never came back together as brother and sister that way yeah. Yeah. you know that's really sad and he he um he when he died he he uh had two t a twin twin daughters and he left them behind so mm. and w what happened to them they're they're in Barbados but we don't have any connection. Mm -hmm. I was trying to adopt them, but it didn't work out. And it just went here wire. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. but I promised him that I would help them. So, but I couldn't, it didn't work out. And that was really hard for me. So, so it is, it's around this time when you get this um, opportunity to leave Barbados and go to the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I I was having a very difficult time. By that time, I was like in and out of relationships. I'd become very promiscuous. I was, you know, in and out of a relationship with opportunistic um, people would take advantage of me. Men would take advantage of me, you know, and I was always being hurt and always alone and I was like I want to get out of this country but I can't because I, I'm poor I, I, I'm a high school dropout my mom can't help me I don't have any help and then a friend um, gave me an opportunity to work as a housekeeper in Canada okay. and I grabbed it and I, I was able to go leave the country to go there right. and that's how I I got off the, and with the in, in with the promise of going, uh, I would go and work for them, and in exchange, I would go to college in the evenings. Oh wow, wow! Like that, so that's a really busy life you went from. <laughs> yeah, I went from Barbados to Canada in very very cold in January. Wow! Like, yeah, mm -hmm. and like, it was your it, first time. Would you say like kind of stepping out of, um, like living outside of? Barbados? Oh, no, I had gone to England to visit a to to visit a boyfriend in England before, so I'd been to England and I came back, and then I got the opportunity to go to Canada. Would you say that that was a really important step in your life in helping break certain patterns? Yeah, my by that time, 
my father had been always traveling. So, but for me as a woman in my family, that was a big moment because I, I was able to leave and as a high school dropout, I was like, wow, this is the, I'm going to, I'm going to get my, my high school diploma and my dreams that I had lost started to come back. Mm. So I was like really excited to get out and be able to work and get the opportunity to go to college in the evenings, but it didn't work out because when I got there, the I was able to um, take my days off, but I never was able to go to college because I was working so hard. Mm, right. You were working as a housekeeper. Was it in like a hotel or? No, a family. Right. It was a family and, um, and um, you, you got there and you got your health care, you got everything, everything was taken care of and, you know, you had your off days. But as soon as I got there, they took my passport because they paid for me to get there. And they said, well, when you pay us back, you will get your passport back. Oh, right. And then um, it didn't work out there. It, it, was, it just became kind of abusive. I just started to be really sick, break out in hives and everything. And, how, and how was it abusive? Like in what way? Were they like physically abusive? I, not physically, just emotionally, I would say, and just working working really hard. And, you know, I had to get down on my knees and scrub the kitchen with toothbrush, all the corners. And it was just really hard work. And we lived in the basement. And then I had my off days. I'd go out and see my friend and come back and it'd start all over again. But I never was able to sign up for college because mm. it just was... A lot of hard work. And how long did you do this for? A couple months. And then I went back to immigration and I told them it wasn't working and what was happening and put a complaint in for, for what they were doing. And they basically told me they got mad with me and told me, you know, if you, you know, you're not going to leave here till you pay us back. So it doesn't matter. So I um, thought I was trapped. But then I called my mom and my mom told me, do you know you have a godmother there? And I was like, oh, okay. Call your godmother. I called her and she, when I told her about it, she said, nope. She came and she paid them everything. And they gave me my passport back and I got out of there and she, I went to live with her. And then I looked for another job. Um, I looked for another job. I went back to immigration, looked for another job and had to stay on long, long lines to to um to find a job and I eventually got one and it was further out in the suburbs and I had to be driving, learning how to get there by bus and everything. It was cold and yeah. there's a lot of snow, a lot of sludge. What, what kind of a job was you this? Slush. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what you call it, what's the right word. What, what what kind of a job was this second one that you worked in? Same kind of job. Right. That was the reason I had housekeeper babysitting. Right. So I had same kind of job. And Would you say like I, the conditions were a bit better the second time around? No, I was mostly with the kids and they spit on me and were abusive. The kids, the parents were gone. And mm -hmm. I just was like, you know what? I can't deal with this. And I told my godmother, I'm going to go over the U.S. and I crossed over to the U.S. with my visa. And I was like, I'm just, I don't, I can't go back to Barbados. There's nothing there for me. So I crossed over and, you know, that's how I overstayed my visa. My visa was only for a vacation and I just overstayed it. And that's where I began. I made a bad decision. And that's where we got back to the beginning where I finally found Buddhism and they told me right I so to so hold on just so walk me through you 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 move over to the U.S. with the visa that was still valid in in from Canada in were you US. able to so I had, had a visa enough. from Barbados to go over to because the whole thing was that I'd go to Canada I'd go to college and then I'll come over to the U.S. 
for vacation, go back, do my work, go to college, come, and I could go back and forth. Right. But you, I just stayed the visa. It was only supposed to be a vacation. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I realized I'd made a mistake and I didn't know how to get out of it. And I found Buddhism. I was suicidal, tried to commit suicide one evening and it didn't work. I woke up in, I woke up and I was alive. So mm. a few weeks later, I found Buddhism in a subway, a New York subway. And I, it just wore, it just immediately, immediately, I felt like I had come home to something that was really special and beautiful. And I just started to chant. Namiho Renge Kyo, which Tina Turner is, it helped her out of domestic violence. And I learned about that, and that was inspiring. But I just chanted Namiho Renge Kyo, and it set everything right in my, the very core of my being. It set everything right. And I learned that by going to meetings and stuff, I learned that I was. I had choice in my life right. and the choices I made life was about cause and effort and causes that you create are the causes that you're going to get back coming mm -hmm. back at you. And I had made causes that would not ever be right, would not bring me the things that would benefit my life. I had to change that by making causes that would uplift my life. And they told me that first thing I had to do was to set that immigration situation right. I had to go back and face it. And whatever the result, whether I could come back or not, I had to face it and deal with it. If I, I had to take that one way ticket and go back to Barbados. And if I couldn't come back, that was the way how it was supposed to be because I had made that choice right. in the first place. And that's so such I a had, risky thing as well, in a sense. Yeah, because... yeah. But I had faith. I believed that this practice was going to lead me in the right direction for my new life. So... Yeah. I said, you know what? What I'm I'm going and I just practiced and chanted and chanted and chanted and I I had friends and advocates here I told them they knew that I wanted to they learned about my story and they felt that I had I was an artist and I could do all I that I had all this potential. So they helped me and I was able to get back, got the one way ticket and got back. And I was went back and I faced immigration, not sh not ever knowing if I was going to come back. Mm. But I had advocates in Barbados. I told them my story and stuff, and they said, okay, we're going to help you. And I got advocates there, and I had advocates over here, and it took a while. And then I was able to get my student visa, and it was one of the most amazing, powerful experiences. And that's when I knew that this chanting, Namiaho Rengikyo, was it. Yeah. I had been a Christian all my life, but I had never seen a powerful result like that. Mm -hmm. and I was like, no, this is it. This is it. And so I just kept chanting and, and improving my life all the way. I just never stopped. And I got into college, came back, got into college, made the dean's list. A lot of stuff happened along the way that was, you know, because it's like, in Buddhism, one of the um, the founders, he says, like, it's like a glass bit of water and you have, it's filled with sediment and the sediment will settle at the bottom if there's no action, there's no shaking of the glass. The, the sediment will stay at the bottom and it'll just be water and sediment at the bottom. But if you stir that sediment, if you stir that water, the sediment is going to dispersed throughout the glass and that's what happened with my life i stirred the glass of water that was my life and the sediment dispersed and so once i started to chant if that sediment has to settle and it you'll if you wash a glass with water that you stir stir with sediment it takes a long time before that sediment settles down and basically that describes the evolution or what we call the human evolution that i've been on since I started chanting and the sediment was like so many negative things because there were causes that I made in my life that I had to face, you know, 
Mm. Good and bad. What does that and chant mean? Like, how would you translate this in English? For me, well, you know, I when I first got it, I remember getting it get, chanting in the darkened subway. And when I met that person on the subway, I had been a Christian for so long and I, I tried to commit suicide. And I, and I said, I'm not a Christian anymore. I don't have any beliefs because I've been saying our father who art in heaven for so long and I wasn't getting any results. And so when I found that chanting, I was empty. I didn't have any beliefs. And that day when I found it in the subway, um, I remember I was standing on the edge of the subway and this guy came up to me. He said, do you know the power of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo? And I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, yeah, it's it can change your life. And I said, what is it? And he said, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, say it. And I said, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And I felt like lightning strike from the top of my head right through my body to my toes. And I was like, what the hell was that? And he said, you just... You just chanted, and I said, wow, that is amazing. Tell me more. And then he t basically gave me an idea. He said, I said, what does it mean? And he said, well, it, it's really hard to explain. You have to go through the whole thing, and but it basically means, and he gave me a rough description, dedication to the law of cause and effect through sound. Mm. The law, dedication to the law of cause and effect through sound. And I carried that with me, and I was like, cause and effect the lotus sutra the the um the lotus flower you know is the representation of cause and effect it blossoms it blooms it seeds and it blooms at the same time oh. and it's very unique phenomena mm -hmm. and it's in the mud but it never is defiled by the mud right so i just love that and i i just I, it just meant something to me. And basically, I found out that in this practice, if we believe that we have choice and we choose our parents, we choose the conditions we come into this life with from as energy. We choose the conditions before we are even born into this human body. And when I learned that, I was like, wait, I chose the condition to be in this family that was that caused me so much suffering and and that was it was hard to understand that but it made then i felt well if i can choose this bad situation i can choose to find my way out of it right so that. if i choose from before i came into this body as energy to choose the situation that was so painful and caused me so much suffering then now i'm in this body i can choose to change that mm, yeah and so i began from 29 years old to begin to change that right yeah, that's amazing you know too. and it's a it was a long journey i'm over 30 something years in chanting now and it just i i'm just seeing the evolution of this human evolution is mm. changing my life and I've gone through so much suffering. It doesn't mean it doesn't stop the pain and suffering, but you can stand in the middle of all the pain and suffering and you chant and you believe that you will get through it. Right. And you do and you take the good with the bad. Mm. That's amazing. You know that it's your life is, if you hold on and you hold out, and sometimes people don't make it. Sometimes yeah. the, they, they have chosen, they, have, they chose to leave early or they chose to be sick and never recover. Mm. But I, in this situation here, I chose at this moment to recover from this cancer because I have something bigger to do. Right. Can so you walk I us through the, that way. the cancer? Hmm? So what, what happened with regards to cancer? When did this um, happen to you? Well, the cancer, I learned when I was 52. When I was 52, I learned that I had this marker for um, multiple myeloma, which is a rare blood cancer, and it was devastating. It was 2015, and I learned that all, everything stopped. Mm. And 
I spent from that time until until last year when this lesser let this this less aggressive cancer, which is um lymphoma, showed up on my spine. I spent from 2016, 2015, 2016, back and forth in doctor's offices, um, getting tests and stuff. I had to be tested every three months and then every six months. And then through the pandemic, I couldn't get tests done anymore because of what was happening with the pandemic. And then everything cleared, finally went back to the doctor and they did. And well, you know, I didn't go to the doctor. I just could stop, um, suddenly couldn't walk anymore. Oh gosh. One day, you know, I couldn't walk over a space of six days. I was becoming paralyzed and I had to be rushed to emergency surgery when, because they found this massive tumor on my back that it manifested on my back. Right. And I look at, looking at it through a Buddhist lens. The fact that it manifested on my back to me represented the burdens, all the, the, the sufferings and stuff that I carried for so long through trial, childhood. I carried that and it all man, it all came together on my back. Right. You know? So. Yeah. Cancer is just not just... Um, the physical manifestation, it has to do with the emotional, psychological, maybe the stuff, the exposure to certain things, you know, it's all this stuff. Yeah, for the sure. The stress, the resentments, mm -hmm. all that wrapped around my spine. Did, um, <clears throat> did you seek treatment all in the U.S.? It's, I know it's pretty expensive there. So yeah, you um, insurance? It, I didn't. It just happened over a space of six days. I suddenly couldn't walk. I started losing mobility. And I remember it, it actually was coming up. I, for some reason, I, I, I had forgotten and I thought it was going down, but the, the coldness was coming up from my feet. At one point, I thought, I remember saying it was coming down from under my breast, but no, it was coming up from my feet. And I, I was beginning not to be able to walk and I kind of was around say the that was the end of twenty twenty one. I was beginning to feel really sick. I was sleeping all the time, I was putting on weight and I suddenly couldn't ha eat anything that had histamines or citric acids. And most foods have that. So I could mm. hardly eat anything, only meat. Even meat had it. I had to order special meat from farms that had prepared the meat in a certain way that the histamines wouldn't set in. It was very weird. Right. And it just suddenly, one day I woke up and I, it, it, towards the end of those six days, uh, around a year ago, it was March 25th, 24th. I tried to go to the bathroom and my bladder broke as I was trying to go and I couldn't control my bladder. And I, I it was early in the morning. I walked, crawled, dragged my leg. I was, had to use a cane and I dragged myself to the bathroom and I sat there on the toilet, closed toilet for from four to seven in the morning because I was like, how am I going to do this? I have so many things going on in my life. My daughter has health issues um, that have been taking care of her for so long. You know, my my husband and I, we were debating if we should separate or not. Uh, you know, we had bills. We had all these things that were going on. It's like, how the hell am I going to do this? I was worried about insurance. If I was going to get a doctor that looked like me from 4 to 7 o'clock in the morning on the 24th of March last year. And then all the time, the coldness kept coming, creeping up, creeping and up, creeping up. And by seven o'clock, I realized I can't do this anymore. And I tried to stand up and crash to the floor. And I called my daughter and told her, get everything ready. I have to go to the hospital, call the ambulance. 
the ambulance came and they had to take me out in a special chair. And I got to the hospital. They did all these tests and said, you have a massive tumor. All within in less than 24 hours. Mm. We have to immediately take you. You have 50% chance of paralysis. Wow. And a couple of weeks before that, I was diagnosed with panic disorder, agoraphobia, and PTSD. I learned all that a few weeks before from my therapist. So thankfully that I knew that I had that diagnosis. So when the panic and stuff set in, I knew, okay, right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> thankfully I, know exactly I had that diagnosis. Yeah. And my daughter was diagnosed with the same thing at the same time too. So oh my gosh. I was able to find presence and by chanting and and using the tools that I had pulled together over the years, included a system I developed called Clarity Awareness Presence, Acceptance and Gratitude. I was able to bring myself into presence and I was put myself in that on that lotus flower where Although I was out in all this mud where they were telling me I had all this cancer, but I was on that lotus flower and that wasn't going to touch me inside. And I visualized that throughout the whole time I was in the hospital, throughout the operation. And I utilized Louise Hayes' self-affirmations and, and I just, just Eckhart Tolle's presence, the power of now. Right. I just utilized all these things and I just stayed present and no matter what was happening, I just went with the flow and I was like, I'm going to walk again. I'm not going to. Mm. And then when I came out to the surgery, my legs started to move and this. One of the doctors told me, well, this you're in the 1%. This is rare. This is you're in the 1% to, to do this. We got to rush you to rehab. You're in the one rare one percent to do this. Your legs are moving. This really shouldn't be happening. Mm. And once that happened, I just said, "You know what? I'm gonna walk by this summer." It's like once again, these chants kind of like yeah. really pulled itself together for you, right? Yes, yeah. I said I'm gonna walk again by the summer. I remember when I came home from rehab, I told the nurse, the first nurse, that because I had nurses come into my house. And I told her, I'm going to walk by the summer. She said, don't get ahead of yourself. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and by the summer, I was walking. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Power of Namia Horenge Kyo. Yeah, I like that. I'm definitely going to put that in there um, in the description as well, those words, because I'm pretty sure there might be some individuals, you know, that would like to look into it at least a little bit more and um, see how they can yeah, it's that very, it's, it's very personal for me. I, you know, it, it's something that's very personal for me. My faith is very personal, but if asked, I will tell people about my experience about it, with it, you know, because yeah. it's yeah. very central to my life. Would, would you say it's this chant that sort of like really helped pull, pull you out of even those negative patterns, the negative mindset, I feel like to an extent, the mindset also really helped change the direction of your life in a sense. Oh, yes, because from the time I found this chant, it's my life has never been the same. Mm -hmm. I have, like, I, my, my middle name is Claire, and I use, I remember um, always loving that, that my middle name was Claire and always wanted to use it, but it means bright. And when I was diagnosed with, when they told me that I had this marker for myeloma, I remember I'm going to start using clear more. I had started in my late forties, but then I, I read, because clear means bright and I want to live a bright, optimistic life. Yeah. And so that's why I use my middle name. It's my artist name. Um, I go by Claire because it's just when I think about Claire, I think about brightness. In the hospital, I was, I they used my my full name. They didn't use Claire. They used my full name, um, my my um my full name, and they didn't use Claire. And I came out of the hospital. I was like, wait a minute. All the documents that I had to sign in the hospital was with my name, Cheryl. 
but Claire was not there. Claire was never touched by the cancer. Right. Everything was under my, under Cheryl, right, but it's right. not, Claire's, Claire's totally untouched, untouched part of me. So in my new life, I use Claire. Wow. Right. That's amazing. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like how, because you, you mentioned earlier that you were diagnosed with PTSD, agoraphobia, anxiety. And um, panic disorder. Panic disorder. You mentioned that your daughter also has it. Again, it's kind of like going back to the theme around this episode where, you know, it's it's passed down generations. Yes. Would you say like, did you have this during pregnancy? Well, I think so. And I, I read something that, um, says I was reading an article about stress in pregnant women. It said thirty percent of pregnant women express experience stress, and that black women are three to four times more likely to die from to die from stress related situations that would bring up blood pressure, all these kind of things, uh, in pregnancy or during childbirth. Right. And I was like, that made sense to me because my daughter, we did a salivary, salivary test where they take your saliva and you, it, they check your hormones with that. And my daughter and I did one together. And when the results came back, both of our cortisol levels were at the same, very, almost flatline, very low. Mm. Our stress was like so, we were, our cortisol levels were so low and it was pretty, we put it side by side and it's similar. Mm. And that was the first time that I had a visual, something visual that showed that right. I passed this on to my daughter. Right. And now we have the same diagnosis. So Yeah. I do believe that I did pass it on to her because I couldn't breastfeed her and I, I couldn't understand why the milk wouldn't come. Mm. And so she didn't, so that's probably why she has health issues. So she didn't get breast milk. I had to start her early on soy mm. and she was crying all the time and she always seemed in pain. And, you know, I was, you know, I had carried a lot of stress all my life. Right. So I really feel I passed it on to her. I find this really interesting. And I, th I think this is something that a lot of mothers um, or women that are planning for children or are going through pregnancy should, you know, definitely listen to and sort of take away from this. W what do you think um, mothers or women planning for children can do to sort of like break that cycle to ensure that their children are not um, pulling in the same sort of um, problems or stresses or issues that mothers carrying? Wow. It's really difficult. Um, you have to really, I would say if you love yourself, you have to, Love, have self love and self care. Feel that you're worthy or feel that you're valuable. But there are so many people in situations that they're so unaware that it's, they're not even going to be able to register that, even if you tell them. It's something that you have to arrive at and you have to be ready, I feel. And, um, for me, I know that it took me years and years and years and years to get to here, too much suffering, through all that stuff. Hmm. So the best thing is to really take care of yourself and try to value yourself so that when you be, if you take care of yourself, of yourself, this child is attached to you. It's not just washing your body and stuff, but it's, I guess, guess talking to your child and playing music and just trying to connect to that fetus, that child that is within you. But the, I was, I guess with me, 
I was trying to do that, but it had this separate, there was this barrier, I guess, that was separating me from my childhood and my pregnancy. You know, I was so um, outside of my body. Yeah. You have to be within your body. And I, there are some people who can do that, do that and there are some who can't because of, you know, other factors. Right. Yeah. Because it's one of those things that's difficult, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think everyone to an extent has some level of pain or trauma that they're living with, you know, mm -hmm. and it could be a childhood thing. It could be with parents, family issues, or it could be, you know, facing bullying in school that mm -hmm. set a lot of insecurities or, you know, th there's always going to be something in life that's going to be really difficult that we're always going to hold on to or, or live with. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a really difficult mm -hmm one to say because yeah how does one really work through some of the the pain and the trauma that they go through right? yes individual experiences you know and there are so many things that's going people who could be going through so many different things as they're pregnant yeah oh you know, it's it's not easy to arrive at that self it's something that it's some catalyst got has to happen to make right. you arrive at that point but yeah Sometimes like that. catalyst doesn't happen when you're pregnant. Yeah. You know, it, it could happen before. It could happen after some people, you know, it just, it's just a very difficult thing to, to give advice on, I guess. Yeah. But I, I agree with you in the sense that a, a catalyst, right, or some kind of a trigger, mm -hmm. you know, for you, it was actually being in that subway thinking about potentially ending your life and then mm -hmm. someone coming up to you and saying, say this chant, and then you feeling that energy mm -hmm. immediate, instantly mm -hmm. in your body. Mm -hmm. for, for some people, it's actively going out and seeking that help, which means, you know, going from one therapist to another therapist to another therapist or mm -hmm. finding it through some kind mm -hmm. of spiritual means. Um, yeah. Yeah, or just, or just or, yeah. Sometimes you meet a partner that is, that is you're in tune with, you know, your life brings that partner to you. Right. Your life, you know, um, in Buddhism, we say the oneness of environment, your life is like a mirror. It reflects what's it is. It's a, it reflects what's what's your life reflects the outside. The outside reflects the inside. Yeah. So it's like, um, if you feel, if you, if you, um, if you have, like me, I had all these struggles and all these crises, everything around me was always connected, crazy, you know? But if you have a calmness, if you live your life, you ha you came up in an, in an environment where you were celebrated, where you felt that love, where you yeah. felt that energy, that you were worthy, that you were valued, that's what you're going to project into the world. You're going to bring a partner in your life that's going to value you. Right. And then when you get pregnant, you know, that that is going to, your child is going to reflect that. Right. Because, you know, you 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 um, attract that energy to you from what you have inside. Right. Um, in terms of like with you and your partner, would you say, did you, do you think that you brought in the same kind of energy as you witnessed with your father into your relationship or did you were you actually able to break that cycle and find a healthier relationship? Well, I would say I've been married for 23 years and so it's been a long journey and so but there were things that came up once the cancer once I learned about the blood cancer it really the fault lines began to appear. It was then I realized that there were a lot of things that I hadn't worked on, that he hadn't worked on. And that's when we began to be, mm. began to see each other. And we were like, wait, do I know you? Do I? And, and it really caused us to have a lot of difficulty. And my, can my husband is also a cancer survivor. And, you know, it's very difficult. But we, um, through the cancer and stuff, we, we figured out things. Um, it's we figured out things a way to 
we are not sure. I'm not sure where it's going to end up, but you know, we we've formed a partnership where where we help each other. That's awesome. And um, I know eventually, I feel that we've grown away from each other, mm. but I think we've come to respect each other's viewpoints. Right. That after you've been married for twenty something years, um, you you come through a lot with your partner. Yeah. So it comes to a point where you you have to see each other as you begin to see each other, your individuality, the individualness of each person and the shortcomings and the things that work, the things that don't work. So mm. we're figuring it out and it's at a different place now that um, a lot, we're dealing with a lot of stuff still, but yeah. we're, figuring, we're figuring it out. We're figuring yeah. out how to move forward. I, I still find it really admirable, though, that you were able to sort of break through that, break past that cycle of what you'd witnessed <clears throat> as a child growing up, watching the way that your dad was with your mom and with you, you know, understanding and realizing that that is not normal. And I'm mm -hmm. going to make sure I break that pattern and find myself yeah. a partner that's at least healthier so that my daughter can witness a healthier relationship and actually use that as a benchmark going forward in her future relationships yeah. as well yeah well she didn't she saw the unhealthy parts of us right <laughs> and that has caused each of us had our own thing to work out you know that things that we didn't even know were, were there you know we discovered it in our marriage and so she saw that and that in turn that in turn uh helped her to know what not to accept and what to accept mm. so it isn't it wasn't she saw the unhealthy parts and she saw the healthy parts and the struggle mm -hmm. and uh you cannot be i mean i'm married for 23 years and it's all smooth and of course. you know yeah. there's a lots of ups and downs and and with the pandemic we had to work all those things out because we couldn't leave right we were like okay we are gonna go and then we had to realize we, we can't leave we have to figure this out mm. on the one yeah and the pandemic kind of made us kind of face things right. in a more creative way and that's what we are doing mm. but it wasn't easy for her for sure. but she's I, she's pretty much a, a really sensible child because she's seen a lot and she's had to deal with a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm really impressed by how she's so level-headed. Yeah. I mean, it's basically because she saw our struggles. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak to her as well and, like, you know, listen mm -hmm. to her version of her story as well um, and share that as well with our listeners because I feel like this would be really great in terms of really like what what the what the premises of our show as well is about is multiple perspectives so multiple versions or perspectives of you know a, a kind of one story in a sense right um mm -hmm. and so it's it's nice to see how like the two stories kind of come together from different viewpoints right yeah mm -hmm. yeah exactly so I, i'm gonna end this interview with one last question mm -hmm. Knowing everything that you know now after you've experienced everything, you, you're able to look at it in a in a bit of a hindsight perspective. If you had to go through it all again, what would you do differently? <laughs> what would I do differently? Man, I would always say I wish that I knew what self-love was. You know, I never knew what that was. I never knew I could love myself. So if I could love myself, I'd want to do that because I didn't love myself or I didn't care about me. I allowed so much damage to happen. Mm. So I just wish I'd known about this whole thing that 
loving yourself was possible. That's such a weird thing to say, but yeah. I, I didn't know that was possible. Right. And how much joy you can have from learning to love yourself and yeah. learning to knowing that you are worthy, you're valuable. Even everything around you tell you you're tells you you're not valuable because you're a black woman, because I'm a black immigrant woman, or I, I came from a poor background, or um, I came from a domestic violence, all these negatives that informed me that I wasn't worthy. But if I only knew that in the midst of all that, I could love myself, I think it would have made a great difference. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, because <clears throat> society has this tendency to place us in certain levels of value based on what they can see, right? How much money you have, how much security you have, how much education you have, what your career mm -hmm. is, and that's what that's what value is. And so we also internalize that, like, oh, if I'm making more money, then I'm more valuable to society, therefore I can love myself more. Um, but... Yeah, I think this is sort of, yeah, you're right, where that self-dialogue, um, that self-willpower is really important to say, hey, against all odds, against what everyone is telling me, what the narrative is around me, I mm -hmm. know that I am worthy of much more. I know that I'm worthy. And, and if I could have only known that I could control these voices in my head that told me I wasn't worthy, yeah. um there were ways to clean that, to clear that emotional palate. Mm, for sure. There were things that I could do to clear that. Right. I didn't know they were think there were all these voices telling me, oh, you're a loser, you're no good, you're you're unlikable, you're this and you're that. And but now I have things that I do that I never get those thoughts. Yeah. For sure. I clear my emotional and mental palette every day constantly yeah. and I fill myself up with positive vibes and it's like I wake up and I could feel my breath you know I can feel my breath I am aware of my breath I I was never I never really felt that that's amazing you know how many of us go through the world and we don't even take a moment to you're aware of that breath and what it feels like going in through your nostrils. Mm, right. Yeah. If you if you take time to feel that, you know, feel the very essence of life flowing through you. Take time. That's an act of self love. I feel. I love that. You see, I'm I'm here. I'm present. I'm worthy. I can feel me. I can feel my life. I I'm valuable. Mm. You know, I exist. I'm not some uh, statistic. Yeah. You know, as small as my little pebble was coming from that little island of Barbados, I can have impact mm. by sharing my story and and maybe somebody will hear it that it will help and motivate them and inspire them. I can use my voice. I can use my writing. Yeah. You know, I'm, I I have value. I'm worthy. Claire, thank you so much for today. I really, really appreciate you being on, on air with me and, you know, sharing your story. You know, it's been a very, very um, inspiring conversation. And, you know, I really appreciate you being vulnerable with us today. If you enjoyed the episode and would like to help support the show, please follow and subscribe. You can rate and review your feedback on any of our platforms listed in the description. I'd like to recognize our guests who are vulnerable and open to share their life experiences with us. Thank you for showing us we are human. Also, a thank you to our team who worked so hard behind the scenes to make it happen. Chris Trzynski, Stefan Menzel. The show would be nothing without you. I'm Jenica, host and writer of the show, and you're listening to Multispective.